as a teacher, I hear I can't meditate. It's impossible for me to do that. I have so many thoughts, uh, so many emotions come up. You will get the things come up in your awareness um, at the right time. So when you're ready for them, the body is going to start presenting. There, there isn't anybody that I haven't been able to teach meditation. So when we think the mantra in the mind, the mantra then starts to help us go beyond thought. So we're doing this process over and over again and we're just releasing little pockets of stress each time and you say there is virtually i think you said there is virtually no limit to what kind of state meditation can bring you in so i was like curious like wow tell me more but instead of having an external relationship they are going to have an internal relationship with the part of themselves that wants to feel loved and then they become whole again Hi everyone, and welcome back to the YouTube channel and the podcast. Today I'd like to present to you an interesting man called Sam. And Sam also used to have ME-CFS, like maybe you have right now and what I used to have as well. But he got out of it, and as of this moment, he is a meditation teacher who lives in Lisbon in Portugal. Thank you for being on the show, Sam. That's great to be here. Looking forward to it. Great. Sam, before we dive into why meditation is helpful for someone with a chronic disease, I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, before you were having a chronic disease or when it was starting. Because when I um, prepared the interview with you, for you, um, I found out that we have so much similarities and a lot of my clients as well they all have so, sort of the same pattern because you told in the interview with, uh, with Raylan that you broke up with a girlfriend, you were studying, you were working at the same time, plus you went to the gym, like um, probably a little bit uh, crazy. And that's almost a copy of my story and everyone else. Like I also was sort of a bodybuilder. Um, a lot of pressure I put on my on working with my uh, my company. I had a, com uh, I worked as a comedian, and also just broke up with my girlfriend, which was actually a very good stress release because that relationship wasn't really without any stress. So basically, you had a lot of self pressure on yourself. And now my question already is because I don't want to really dive into why, but how can we release? ourselves of all these pressures that we put on ourselves how can we um it's i'll give a little bit like so every every since i was a child i was never i always felt like there was something missing i always felt like there was um something i i had to try the hardest just to just to stay afloat it was, uh, so I put myself, I think that the pressure that I put myself under just naturally arose from that. Like, am I good enough? Am I, like, why am I finishing last in the class? Why am I the last person we picked at sports? It's kind of all these, and I was quite an athletic person. Um, but, you know, I was just slower or my mind just wasn't working as fast as it should do. And I was like, it takes me much longer to learn things. And so I think that stems from a very early age, I got switched around schools a few times as well and, and curriculums and everything like that. So it just made it a little bit more challenging. Um, but yeah, ultimately learning to remove stress from our systems and to feel um, like there's no point to prove and you don't have to be the best and, and you just take all this pressure off yourself, it starts to change. Um, because if you have that kind of pressure and you're living with that, that's an alternate, that's a huge form of stress that you're living with and you, and you can't really escape. Um, so it's just with you constantly, you wake up in the morning. Um, so, I mean, for, for me, the, 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 the most important thing was to find a way to release stress, but also reverse stress. And like you've you've shared with me like family uh, generational stress that gets passed down um 
it's kind of like a double whammy or a triple whammy. It's especially if both parents have um, their their issues, their problems, and you're just getting it from both sides, but also your your own stuff that you've developed in your uh, own experience. And then you've got to try and get rid of all of that as well. So it's kind of like every generation is just more and more and more stuff uh, that needs to be cleared out. And we get to you and I, and we start to do something about that because our symptoms have become so extreme. We have chronic fatigue, we have a chronic illness, and then it pushes us. It just pushes us to do something about it because we know it's possible. I think there's something deep down inside that's why people watch these videos is that we know there's a way, there must be a way to heal. The rest of our lives does not have to be controlled by um, a chronic illness. So yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and well, so another similarity that we have is um, change of environment and how that was really helping us. And when we moved back, because that what you said in the interview with Raylan, moved back home, Maybe we feel the pressures again. Maybe we fall into an old pattern and suddenly we feel worse. So in my own journey, I went to tropical beaches and I wanted to stay away from home from home as long as possible. And whenever I was at home, I, f I felt worse. And you had sort of the same experience, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think with Raylan, I was talking about the, my trip to Portugal. I went on like a holiday and that's before I started meditating and I felt, you know, better. I didn't have this, the pressures of work and the expectations in our environment at home. Um, and also the, the, the drier heat, the weather uh, was, was, it felt like, you know, my, almost like my body was healing or recovering in, in some way. Um, and so, yeah. And then you start, you know, at the end of the holiday, you start thinking about all the things you've got to get back to. And, and as soon as I got home, I remember just being like back to square one again. It's almost like the holiday did nothing for me. Um, so yeah, it's environment is huge. Um, and that's one of the things that I talk about uh, with my students. And, you know, at the beginning, we're not going to be confident enough to change our environment, whether it's our workplace, where it's our home, you know, how can I just up and leave or change my career or my office or my employer, whatever, um, my friendship group, there's, it's all of the, you know, the environment is everything around you and it, and it, and it passes on to how you're feeling. You, you sort of feed off your environment in a way until we train ourselves to, to not worry about our environment uh, down the line and we can sort of override all of that. Um, but yeah, so, so when, when we're starting to heal and recover. Now you got me really interested. How can we override this? So um, I, I liken the environment and well, say the input of stress, the inflow of stress into our awareness. If your environment is not good, that's a huge input of stress that's just overriding and, and sort of overwhelming our nervous system. So when someone hasn't got a way to reduce or, or let go of stress um, consistently, then the environment is just chucking more stuff into our nervous system and eventually gets clogged up. And, and that's when things don't start, don't work properly as we can't, uh, we just can't let things out. We, we just hold on to everything. Um, it's, think of it like a traffic jam in our entire nervous system. Nothing works properly. It takes ages and then it starts to all break away. So in time, if we have techniques and, and ways to remove stress from our nervous system, to clear up, to have that, you know, the traffic is now just dispersing and everything's free flowing um, and working well again, we can have experiences, but our body can then process them out and not hold on to them anymore. Then eventually we've become so good at that. All the stress is now starting to leave our awareness that it doesn't matter what situation you put yourself in. Your body is very efficient at removing the stress. And so you can become more um, flexible in, in where you live and the situations that you find yourself in. Um, it's just, it's harder to do. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I actually recovered in a, in a poorer environment, you know, in a job that I didn't enjoy. Um, I was in England. I didn't enjoy the weather. I didn't enjoy just the, the grayness, the hardy sunshine. And I still recovered within that. But it's when I made the step to sort of come out to Portugal and, 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 and so on. 
Um, did I notice another shift? It was like, oh, okay, life's easier now. Um, and, and so on. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and just like uh, just like me, you also w want to go to the south of Europe and uh, more sunshine, and it is just helping my mood every day. Like even in January, I today I it's a bit cold in the house. I'm, sometimes I'm a bit freezing because in, at night it's pretty cold. But even in the day, it's like 20, 20 degrees, and I'm enjoying the sunshine, and that's a huge, huge boost for my uh, for my system. I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's it's like 15 degrees or 16 degrees in Lisbon today. Um, but just to have the sunshine, uh, we actually had a lot of rain recently, um, but just to have the sunshine for the majority of the year makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And, and you went there. yourself out there and actually... Uh, excuse me. So, so you, you said that going there was actually intuition and a leap of faith because you didn't know if th things will work out, right? Yeah, um, well, I actually, as I, before I became a meditation teacher, I had, um, and I wasn't with my, my now wife, um, I had a lot of intuition telling me to either go to San Diego or to go to Lisbon. Now they're very two quite, actually quite similar uh, climates and we're actually seeing a lot of people from California and San Diego actually move to Lisbon at the moment. It's kind of like they, they're leaving America and they want to come over here. Um, so to, you know, and that was just through friends, uh, family, people just putting into my awareness these two amazing places. Um, and so that was always in, on my radar. And then um, I met my, uh, my, my wife and um, we got married this year and, and we moved here about a year and a half ago. So it kind of like, it's, it's an interesting journey that you go on when you start to, to do this, like go to, through this meditation, clearing out stress and this recovery and this whole process that wherever you put your intention, um, you've got to be quite careful because it's, it's kind of, it, it sort of manifests very, very easily. I think um, everything that I wrote down five years ago that I wanted, it's all coming, it's all coming to fruition. So. Um, it's a, it's a very interesting um, thing, this healing journey and, and the, the directions it takes you, takes you through. Yeah, oh, it's, it's lovely that you, that you talk about that. I mean, a lot of people would still be very, very critical, I think, when you have a chronic disease because suddenly the law of attraction doesn't really seem to work. But now that I'm on the other side, sometimes it's a bit crazy because I think about something that would be nice. And then suddenly it's there, maybe the next day or maybe just a few months later, like everything goes faster and faster. And, but that's, I think, for most of people, pretty controversial seeing where they are. And therefore, I would like to move on to, to another, maybe we can, we can park this topic and maybe have another, another chat about the law of attraction. <laughs> but I, I would like sure. to talk about, um, <laughs> yeah, I would like to talk about uh, you being a meditation, meditation teacher and as so many people with a chronic disease are saying things like, I can't meditate, or it's just not helpful or whatever. But you said that uh, meditation is sort of the biggest thing in your recovery. So why meditation for people with a chronic disease? So why meditation? Uh, because I'm going to go straight into the point. Um, meditation in particularly this form of meditation that I teach, it works directly at removing stress from our nervous system. It's kind of like a prerequisite. We don't go and learn meditation just to remove stress. Meditation was never designed for stress. It's for enhancing our awareness and our spiritual, if we're going to go down the road of spiritual, but the spiritual experience, we start to think, you know, and I'm not really, wasn't a religious person, um, an atheist, um, and it starts to open your eyes a little bit to there, there is something going on around us energy wise, that is something that we just can't see or wasn't aware of before. And so in order to have those experiences and to go down that route, there's a prerequisite and that is to purify our nervous system. And so you'll hear me say that a lot. The purification of the nervous system is we have to sort out our mind, our body. 
what's going in the cellular stress that we hold on to in then order to have those um, and it doesn't quite work in a, in a linear way. You will get moments where you'll have some spiritual experiences and stuff. But generally, we need to prepare the body to be able to have those experiences in the mind. So learning to meditate, it helped me realize, A, that I was stressed because I didn't think that I was stressed, didn't feel stressed. That was my normal. We I've normalized what stress was. And then when I closed my eyes and I followed my teacher's instructions, um, and this is a technique that we, we're taught to meditate by ourselves, so we're not reliant on a teacher. But from the very first session, you're kind of guided and shown how to use it um, in the right way. I very quickly realized that this is what relaxation is. And I've never had that experience before. Um, it's something completely different to sleep. Uh, there's an awareness, but also there's an awareness that you're relaxed, but also awake at the same time. So it's almost like you're restful and awake and you're going deeper than sleep. And so it's a very sort of blissful thing that starts to happen and you, it, it grows, it grows, it grows the more we do it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 as a teacher, I hear I can't meditate. It's impossible for me to do that. I have so many thoughts, uh, so many emotions come up. Um, it feels quite scary to um, have, to, to sort of become, to go into that and open that box, that Pandora's box. Um, and the way the way that i i think about it is that you will get the things come up in your awareness um, at the right time so when you're ready for them the body is going to start presenting there's no real easy way of doing it if it's going to come up it's going to come up we just have to have the tools to be able to address it and the support network as well can be really important because it can feel quite lonely when you've got a chronic illness so it's having you know maybe some people don't have anybody but um, this technique is kind of like a friend just putting their arm around you and just giving you that support. You feel like you're part of something greater when you tap into that and you close your eyes and you start to think um, the mantra in the way that we teach. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing and a very empowering experience. Now, it didn't cure me straight away. It took, it took a, at least 18 months or two years for me to go, wow, this is really working. But I did feel the benefits within the practice and a little bit afterwards, but it didn't change my whole, my life in the fact that my symptoms were fading away. It takes time. It's not, you know, chronic illness doesn't just develop overnight. It's, it builds up and it builds up and, and eventually we go, okay, there's something not quite right here. Um, and so the, the reversing process needs to, needs to be given time and the respect that it needs as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's, there, there isn't anybody that I haven't been able to teach meditation. Um, but there are so many techniques out there that it's very, um, it can become a bit of a minefield of where to, where to go, which one to try. Uh, are there free ones? Are there ones where you, you need to pay a teacher to, to give you the guidance and the reassurance along your journey, become a bit of a mentor in a way? Um, so there's, and it's, you know, we constantly go through that, oh, meditation should be for free and, and so on. Um, I'd, I'd love that one day if that, if that was the case and people could teach something and not need money in, in return. Um, but the, it's, it's, it's something that you do. I, in my experience, I needed a teacher. I needed to be shown and have the reassurance that I was doing it in the right way and an ear to, to sort of turn to if things weren't quite going how I was expecting and the motivation behind that as well and the community that 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 we kind of offer is like once once someone learns there's a community of other people going through similar things great um then I've got I've got a little bit a question about um what you're saying what you were saying before because sometimes stress comes up right when especially when you're quiet then and most people nowadays are traumatized. Most of them, they also don't know they're traumatized. So they're completely in their mind, uh, away from their body. But in the body, it's pretty stressful, pretty uncomfortable. It's like, no, I don't want to go there. Plus, emotions can come up. What would you do? What would you suggest to these people? So if, if I had somebody who said, look, I've tried meditation before. It felt very emotional. Um, it's, it feels like quite a scary thing to do. 
um, I would make sure that they've a got some sort of support network. Now that could be maybe they're going to see a therapist because I I think therapy is a very powerful tool um, in the right context. So um, someone we we have you know I come across people and they go to therapy and they kind of use it as a crutch. It's kind of um, just a, a, a download at letting you know and, and speaking to somebody and they need that. Or we can. And I found what's very powerful with uh, somebody who's got a lot of emotions and, and, and it's very overwhelming, i.e. they're very sensitive human beings and things affect them. They have either had developed so much trauma that, that they're just on the edge the whole time and anything sets them off quite easily. Um, so it's about having compassion for yourself. And I think that's a, a big part of this, this whole healing journey and this letting go and just releasing is... Yes, meditation can be quite overwhelming when we first learn. The first couple of weeks, that's why we have a teacher, right, is to guide us through that process. Now, if we're reading it out of a book or finding something online, who are you going to speak to? Um, it's, it's not, you're, not, you're not just um, signing up to learning the technique. You're, you're signing up to having the support network behind that as well. And I think that's really, really important. And I definitely encourage people to go and see a therapist or, or continue especially when they start to learn if they're susceptible to those types of things. I think it's, and it's also you've got to find the right therapist as well. It's, uh, um, yeah. it's a very unique and personal thing. Yeah. Beautifully spoken. Thank you. I think everybody can, can have something with that. or can have, get something out of that. Then another thing about meditation is that people always think that they, their mind needs to become quiet, silent and empty. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? So there are some techniques out there that um, are promoting uh, removing thoughts and, and letting thoughts um, and trying to push them out. Okay, um, the technique that I teach, uh, that I'm very very fond of and, and works really well, is we're not trying to push thoughts out. We're not trying to do anything. We're not trying to tell them to go away. Um, we are. We follow the guidance from a from a, a trained teacher, and and they show us the mechanism how to use a sound. And so, in Vedic meditation, we have a sound. Uh, we call them mantras. Um, they are a set of phonemes that um, resonate with the mind and, and allow the mind to go to a deeper state of um, consciousness. And so, we go from a very busy surface, like was the surface level of the ocean bobbling along our thoughts every day we're, we're pretty much in that zone and then when we use our mantra it starts to take us away from that so when we think the mantra in the mind the mantra then starts to help us go beyond thought or below thought in this analogy and we're going down into a deeper state where there's less thinking and so you, you basically go the mantra helps you go down you let go of the mantra eventually and then you go into a deeper state and then that's where that deep state is when we start to release stress and we can call that the parasympathetic nervous system. And from that point, we start to release stress, i.e. more thoughts come up. So in this technique, when we release stress, thoughts come up and then we sort of bubble up to the surface level again. It's like, oh, I'm thinking and we come back to the mantra. So we're doing this process over and over again and we're just releasing little pockets of stress each time. So we're not going straight down and we're not thinking that my meditation's got to be calm the whole way through. We actually have a lot of meditations, especially at the beginning, where it feels like they're very thought-filled, but we still feel relaxed and calm at the end of them. So something's definitely happening. Um, so it's about going through, having the thoughts, going into the deeper experience, and up again, and, and so on. So it's about having both, a, a little bit of every single stage. Um, and when someone learns, they might just feel like they're just having thoughts the whole time. And that's the interesting thing is because they won't be aware of going deep, especially at the beginning, because it's a whole new experience. And they might feel like you've fallen asleep or you've just blacked out or something like that. Um, put it this way. If you're aware that you're having no thoughts, you're thinking. You're thinking that you're not thinking. And that catches people out a lot. It's like you're sitting there and there's no thoughts and blah, blah, blah. And you're thinking. So we just, we come back and we, we, we follow the technique in the way that it was taught. Um, so it's not about clearing the mind. Eventually you'll find that your mind naturally becomes clearer and 
and more efficient, let's just say, because say we've got someone like uh, a controversial figure like Elon Musk, I always remember him on the Joe Rogan podcast and they were smoking weed or something. And he was just saying how many thoughts he has come up in his mind. And it's just continuous thinking all the time. So take something with someone like that. We throw in this technique and that the amount of thoughts, the, the quality the quality thinking starts to rise up and all the stuff that sort of fits in between and trying to um, sabotage our mind starts to fade away. So we have all the stuff that's the good stuff, that the stuff that's worthwhile thinking uh, start to come into play. Um, so you're really just taking out the trash. Uh, that's how I, the analogy I, I use is that every time we meditate, we're taking out some trash and we're doing a spring clean on a daily basis. And then eventually that spring clean turns into a, we don't need to spring clean as much as we used to. Um, so we're that. cleaning up our, our hard drive, we're cleaning up our, our nervous system. Yeah. Get all the stress out. I also talk about that with my clients and in the recovery program. Just releasing, I call it releasing. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Peter Levine calls it discharging. Just get rid of yeah. the, the stress and don't and learn to not add new stress to it because we're also learn what well, we are adapted to love stress somehow, right? Yeah, yeah. And and then we also get into this loop of I need to get the stress out of my system as soon as possible. How am I going to do it? Mm. I'm going to start to get stressed about getting the stress out. And uh, <laughs> I see it a lot with students. That, yeah, we want to be consistent and we want to meditate consistently and, and so on. That's how you get the results. But if you're stressing out about trying to get your meditations in the whole time, then it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive. So I have a bit more of a relaxed uh, view on it. Um, but yeah, it's it becomes almost a game or a, 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 new, a new obsession to get the stress out of our systems. And I've seen teachers sort of focus on this too much. Um, and I think in my own recovery journey, I don't know about you, but when I started to put my foot, take my foot off the gas on trying to recover as fast as possible, that's when the, the, the benefits started to come out. And I felt like my, when I took the pressure off myself, um, yeah. like I gave myself a time limit and so on. Um, I kind of just let go. I was doing, you know, flying across the world, trying to look at genetics and everything like that, like try and pinpoint exactly what's going on. Um, but just taking a step back. And I think that's a big part of life is to, to not get so caught up in the small stuff and just to take a step back and have a, a wider perspective um, can, can do a great deal of good as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks for putting it out. Yeah. For everyone. I also, I can, I think it's in the ninth module where I, say to people like forget about it just leave the program for a while and and and, and enjoy your life as, as best as you can just forget about it yeah. and before you were also mentioning the wave that's the what i call always the wave of recovery so put people in a good state stress comes up because it's not it's no longer needed for that good state somehow it's like not resonating anymore so it needs to leave you and then people go down and then yeah. a release and then put them in a good state and then we are sort of surfing the wave of recovery. That's how I call it. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen or heard of anyone go from deep illness, chronic illness to full recovery without any hiccups along the way. It's not. And, and it's kind of just to have that expectation. Like you're going to have some good days. You're going to have some bad days and you're going to have less bad days. The more you know, we do all the right things that we need at that point. So it's, and when the bad days come, it's just having that compassion and going, look, it's been worse. I'm going to be, I'm going to get better. Um, yeah. And we just move forward in that way. And, and yeah, it's just allowing, sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better. But I think we're going to see that in the world in general. Um, <laughs> I think we need, you know, with everything, it's kind of, we have this cycle, especially in, in the Vedic perspective, of cre um, creation, maintenance, and, and destruction. We see it, it's, it's part of everything. It's a circle of life. And so we have these mini loops that, that run in our own system. And it's kind of like the old belief patterns. We're going to, we created those and we're going to maintain them and feed them. And then eventually they have to be destroyed. We have to break them down and we, and we create something new. And we're going through this process the whole time. Um, yeah. 
So I, I definitely see a recovery journey in the same way. Yeah, I feel like we're sort of on the same path, although we do different approaches. And that's why I really wanted to talk to you as well about meditation and how it's all maybe about awareness in the end, right? It's all about becoming aware of who you are, how you feel, and, and stress. Yeah, yeah, it's having, it's having that connection. When you have that and you build that connection with yourself, then you kind of you, you start to learn and intuitively know what you need. Um, it was like in, in New Year, everyone's going out celebrating. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Everyone's like, oh, we're going to have this big night out. We're going to go crazy. And me and my wife were just like, no, I'm just, we're going to chill. We're going to have a quiet night. We've just moved house. We're not going to use this end of year, New Year thing as an excuse um, to have a really late night. And we just were like, it's been a long year. We got married and, and so we had lots of things going on. So it's, we're just going to chill. And um, we just listened to ourselves and we were like, okay, we're not going to do what everyone else expects. We're going to do what we feel like doing. Um, and we feel like staying in is the, the best approach this time, this year. And yeah. it was, um, <laughs> we felt great the next day. So you get rewarded for listening to yourself. Um, it's and, and and when you do listen to yourself and things just start to to work life becomes less uh, you go with the car instead of against it there's uh, less resistance to the things that you want to do i like that i i also went to bed at nine by the way For, forget about everything <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> no party no we alcohol. did make it till 12. <laughs> oh wow oh i was already long asleep we made it till 12 we had some champagne yeah but we uh it's, uh, it's good. Hey, another really interesting thing that I would like to ask you is uh, you said in your second talk with Raylan that you can go to deeper states of being or something like that. Maybe I used the wrong words. And you say there is virtually, I think you said there is virtually no limit to what kind of state meditation can bring you in. So I was like curious, like, wow, tell me more. Yeah, so um, the more uh, so the more stress that we and and this this doesn't happen when you learn to meditate, right? This isn't at the beginning, but as time goes on and the more refined your nervous system becomes, um, the more connected you feel not with just yourself but the universe in general. And so, what happens in meditation is that, and I teach this on the course, it's like you you're starting to regain this connection and we call this uh, this connection the unified field of consciousness so um when we close our eyes and we think a mantra we're dropping into this unified field this fourth we call the fourth state of consciousness and it's transcendence and it's this 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 energy that connects everything so imagine like everything has a is tapped into a sort of an energy source and invisible strings everywhere and everything is all always connected and you start to sort of swim and play in that sort of state of connection. Um, coincidences are no longer coincidences. It's kind of, you just, you just see it all, all sort of, un, or feel it unfolding. And the more we do this, the, the less stress we have in our system, the stronger this connection is, is what I've found. And the less sort of emotional we become in situations, uh, free, a sense of freedom, not worrying about what anybody thinks of us. Um, it's there's a it's very liberating in time, and we start to discover new things about ourselves, and um, we become more inquisitive in in the universe. Like, what's our purpose here? Why are we on this little blue and green planet, circling around a sun? It's like this is bizarre. Like just being here. Um, <laughs> And so it starts to question like my bigger purpose, like what am I here to do, and um, how do I feel aligned in, in, in what I do, and um, maybe we think that we're doing the right thing. Um, you know, in my in my in my case, I, I was working in a job that I thought I should be doing because that's what society conditioned me to thinking I should do. And then mm -hmm. once I realised that actually my job wasn't making me happy, and I was getting nothing, no sense of fulfilment from it at all. 
then I started to go, okay. And then I, I, I learned meditation and I was like, wow, how do I do this? And at the beginning, I, I thought there was no chance. Um, just the confidence to be able to speak in front of, to people and, and to groups and to large groups and so on just became, it was just, I was out of this world. I just couldn't see it. But in time that changed and it's it just had you just develop the more we meditate the more consistent we are the deeper the practices do because we can do the basic course and 99 percent of, of people that, that learn will just do that or we can take it you know that one percent can take it even further and they want to go down that rabbit hole and they want to investigate and and see you know what how deep can we go within our own sense of self our own consciousness state and how do we develop that and then how can we bring uh, what we find out into the world and start to contribute back um, and I think that's a big part of my journey and something I'm going through right now is that it's always been quite a selfish journey to get to get better and now I'm getting to a point where it's like yeah I want to help people that's, that's why I teach meditation because it's amazing but how what can I do more now like how can I be um, of service more and so that's something that I'm now transitioning into and, and, and finding ways to um, help more people and, um, and and do it in a way that you, in a way that you're not expecting anything back. It's just you just want to just be there to serve in, in a sense. Um, and how and do you so, have yeah, we, someone, go, some... we refine our senses. Sorry. Did, do you already have some ideas in what you're going to do? Um. They're coming up. Then they're, they're not. It's just more more of my awareness and, and and things are sort of coming into my awareness now. Where I'm just like, okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, I wasn't having these types of thoughts come up before, and so it's just a natural transition. And and I kind of just I, I don't force it. I'm just I take that seat back. I'm sitting back and I'm just allowing things to come to me. And that's that's what's you know a huge thing in my life is I try to force things before. I really try to force like, I don't know, uh, I want a relationship or and as soon as you put your foot on the, on the gas, uh, on the on the brake and just go, okay, I'm stepping back, I'm just going to surrender um, is, a, is a huge word and I teach some Navy SEAL veterans that don't like that word um, and it's, <laughs> but it's once we understand what it means in that situation, it's like, yes, uh, I need to surrender, yeah. I need to let go. Um, surrendering doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can actually be a very liberating thing, um, but yes, like, like I said, so the deeper we go down this sort of rabbit hole uh, with meditation, it just becomes this this incredible journey, and we can take it further. We can do it more advanced practices, um, and we can refine our our senses. A, a lot of people, when they um, when they recover from chronic fatigue, they it's a bit like with long COVID or something like that. They, they, they report that they don't have the sense of taste or smell it starts to become dampened. So they're not, they're not, the, the senses are not as enriched as what they once were. And I find that the more I meditate, the more heightened those senses become. We start to become um, more aware of the things that are good for us and the things that are bad for us. And, and we just have a feeling and we we see more, we smell more, we we taste more, we get more out of life. Um, mm. So you could say in a, in a way, it's in a weird way, it's like superhuman senses in a way. You start to develop those and, and sort of they start to grow and grow and grow. Um, and from what I'm told, the the experience is endless. It's not something, uh, it just stops. And my meditation journey is still continuing. It's... I'm still finding new things, new experiences. You don't just meditate for six years and, and go, okay, I've completed it. Um, it's it's a continuous uh, development uh, evolution. You know, the whole point really of meditation is to self evolution, to improve, to learn, to grow, um, and that's what the chronic illness has done for me. Is it put me on this path? Now, whether we do something that I do or something you do, it's all going to find its way. Uh, to evolution I love this answer thank you <laughs> it's a long one <laughs> yeah so you said some really cool cool things in between I think I've already forgotten uh, what else I wanted to ask you about but 
you said somewhere like people who want to have a relationship. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so you said about people who want to have a relationship. Um, I ask this to a lot of people, like, why? Why do you want something? Or I want to have a big family. Why? Why did you want to have a big family? And then she asked me, she answered me, I wanted to feel loved. But unfortunately, having the family led to the exact opposite of feeling loved because the feeling that she was running from was still inside of her. So I said, what's the opposite of wanting to be loved? Of What is the opposite of being loved? So being unloved. So I said, let's be with that, you know, let's be with the feeling of being unloved. What does that mean? Where is this in your body? Where did you push this away? It's usually somewhere in the heart, you know, like this pretty deep pains that we have of being unloved, disconnected. And then people start to, to cry in coachings as well immediately and they can maybe release it or just feel it. And then they, if they, for example, in your example, they want a relationship, but instead of having an external relationship, they are going to have an internal relationship with the part of themselves that wants to feel loved. And then they become whole again. And they have a relationship with themselves. And this is going to be projected in the external world. And someone will come to them and they will have a relationship because now it's matching, like in, as within, so without. That's what I experience myself and with clients all the time. And mm -hmm. yeah, like what, what you said, like you actually become whole and via your meditation practice or via the work that I do, I think, I, I, I think it's all about wholeness, becoming whole internally. And that's another word for healing eventually, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, the way that I teach it is a sense of fulfillment. Um, when we're when we're sort of starting our healing journey, maybe we we have a bit of an extracting relationship with the world, and and we believe that when we get certain things, it's going to make us feel whole and happy. Um, but that's just not how it works. We don't um, when we rely on external factors to help us feel whole and happy and loved, then we're missing the big the big thing here, and that is to develop that self-love, um, that inner fulfillment and happiness that's sort of buried. I always think about stress and trauma is like just more rubbish that gets chucked on top of that happiness that's already within. And when we start doing the work, we start to uncover that. We start to get little glimpses, start shining out. Um, and then in time, we, we just have it there and we have that sort of straight connection. We have that happiness. Um, and then when we discover that, we don't use external things anymore to make us ourselves feel happy. So if we're thinking about a breakup, I'm going to go and get a Ben and Jerry's to, to help me get over that. I just want to feel like happy, like just for even five minutes or 10 minutes and then regret it an hour later. Um, we get to a point where we don't need that. It's just always with us. And so sometimes people think, oh, well, you become a bit robotic then if you don't need if you don't go through those emotions, it's like, I go through those emotions. I have those feelings, but I don't let it override me. And we, we let those feelings and emotions flow through you. It's a very different thing. Um, so the spin on this is that with relationships, once you've developed that relationship with yourself and that strength and that, that self-love and compassion and happiness, then you start to emit that self-love, that compassion that happiness out into the world and then you're not looking for something that you're lacking in another partner and this is the this is the important thing with relationships from my perspective is that if if you are missing things in your life and then you're using somebody else to then um make up for it something that you're missing or you're lacking and you think oh because they've got that then they're a better match for me then you're relying on them and you're going to build up expectations on them to, to keep giving you that. It's a bit like a drug. Like you keep, keep giving me that so I can feel whole again. There's no self-reliance. You're, you're relying on someone else to be able to make you happy. And so when we start to do the work and we become happy, you're not looking for that in somebody else. You're looking for someone who can just like together, you just become even better. Mm. And you're not looking to fill a void. 
and that's when relationships can just go to to a next level and and you're you're on the same wavelength um and you're a unit you become you know two people become like a whole uh, a unit and it just works really well from my perspective anyway uh, maybe yeah. give me 10 20 years and maybe that'll be a different story <laughs> we'll see <laughs> yeah no for, for me that's that's the exact same and it doesn't mean that everything is simple uh but uh what I've noticed over and over again is that life is becoming lighter. Well, and actually because I need less from the external world, there is not a lot of effort anymore that I need to put in things because it's all good. And even last week uh, or maybe a few weeks ago, I put my wallets to, on, on the car and I drove and the wallets fell off. And I didn't even know that I lost my wallet with all my money before someone returned my wallet. It was like so simple. Life wasn't completely, everything was going simpler and simpler and I don't need to put effort in, in anything anymore sometimes. That's how it, at, yeah. that's how it's starting to feel. And uh, ask me as well in 10 or 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was reading, I was reading your website and it sort of, um, and, and you mentioned about just if you've got symptoms and you can't sleep and just get rid of the smartphone, get rid of that stimulation, um, try and make things simple, as simple as, as can be. Um, and you might stare at the ceiling for a little while and, and feel terrible, but in time, it'll help you feel more relaxed. And this, I think the problem we have in today's world is we've got so many things, so much stimulation from all the different angles. You know, why are people getting more chronic illnesses? Because there's more stimulation out there. There's mm. more in this technological, the technological world that we live in. Everything is fast-paced. Everything is now, 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 or yesterday. And so it it, it build that the amount of stimulation that our nervous system can handle is is currently going into overwhelm. And add that into the mix as well, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. So it's a yeah, we can we we're not all going to be able to run away to caves and just 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 remove ourselves. You know, that's not why we're here to, to live. It's the majority of people are going to want to go out and, and to, to engage with other people, with, you know, have communities and, and so on. So it's about modern, becoming more, it's like putting a, a jacket on that is a, helping us uh, live in a modern life and, and to not be so um, constrained by the stresses of life. Um, mm. I love this. Can I ask you a final question? Because you offer meditations and meditation courses, uh, retreats, I think, as well. Plus, I saw that you yeah. have created some new products or products. Maybe that's the wrong word. But you've created something new that people can do something on demand. Can you tell me what people with a chronic disease who are watching this uh, might get from your services? So my, the fundamental technique is Vedic meditation, which is a four day course. Um, but then I realized that it seems like quite a jump from not knowing how to meditate to spending the money and doing a four day course, seven hours in total, um, with strangers can feel a bit daunting. So what I did was I designed the uh, meditation on demand course, which is an eight part uh, two and a half hour course in total um, that allows someone just to to log in and just watch in their own time and to give them the confidence that they can meditate because I think that a lot of people don't um, want to learn meditation because they don't believe that they can do or they've tried an app or they've tried some sort of guided meditation and it just hasn't got them to where they thought that they were supposed to get to and so I just, it's an entry level course that on demand one is relatively cheap. Um, and it gives you a lot of value. And the idea is to give people the confidence to do that course. And then they realize they can meditate, but how they want to go deeper with it now. They want to go to the next level and they want to really get their healing journey going. And so what I do is I, if they pay, let's say 50 pounds for that on demand course, They'll, and they want to upgrade to the Vedic meditation course and they'll get that 50 pounds off the Vedic meditation course. So it's really just a way to help get more people meditating, to realize they can meditate and to have the confidence in it. And then they'll, they'll want to come and join the, the, the live 
the live courses. Um, and then some people, they, they want to come and do a retreat. Uh, for me, a retreat was huge in my healing journey. Just being able to go off grid for a week or three or four days at a time, it just gave, it just allowed my distress in my nervous system just to speed up the, the removal of that. Um, that was huge. Um, and so and there's, there's going to be some more advanced courses that I'm going to be offering down the road as well. Um, but yeah, it's really the Meditate On Demand, the entry level one. Um, you're really not sure about doing the main course. Um, try it out. Not too much to lose. Um, and then you can upgrade if you want to, if you, if you feel like it resonates with you and you like me as a teacher. I think that's an important thing as well, to, <laughs> to, to like your teacher. Uh, to so that they can help inspire you on your journey as well. That, I think that's really it's a huge part of it. Um, and and then go for retreats and and you know this the ultimate nourishment I think is having Ayurvedic food, uh, not having to worry about anything. We turn our phones off. We go into a proper digital sort of detox. And you know there's massages that you can have as well, and it's really complimentary. But having the, the, the delicious Ayurvedic sort of organic. Uh, everything's home produced food um, just to be in that setting just to switch off and sleep as much as you like we meditate a lot um, but it's tailored for each individual it sounds sounds lovely i'll i'll put the links to the, in the comment of uh, in the in the description so that every, everyone can uh, can find you and thanks a lot for this interview sam thanks for coming my pleasure Thank you. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was a nice talk. <laughs>